Brent Venables named the starting quarterback for Ole Miss. Who is it? You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. Shout out to all the everydayers out there. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet, and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. He's Jay Smith. I'm John Williams. And again, thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Jay, Brent Venables on the Rudy's Coaches Show, named Jackson Arnold the starter. Is this the right call? Yeah, it sounds like it should be. He was the one that made the least mistakes last game, and it looks like he had a little bit more of a command of the offense. I feel like he made some adjustments on the fly, and so we're going to need a dude that's going to get rid of the ball. And it's nothing against Michael Hawkins. He was doing that great against Tennessee, did it against Auburn, but Texas, it just did not look good. And then, you know, against South Carolina, not to really his fault with the pressure, but... That first interception, he should have led J.J. Hester instead of trying to throw it underneath, especially because he was like kind of watching the wide receiver there. The fumble, can't have that. And then the third interception that he threw it really deep when he was getting hit, I didn't see anybody over there. So it just unfortunate, all the unfortunate circumstances that came down on Hawkins and that it you have to transition. And then from there, honestly, because he made those three mistakes, he, it at this point, you may as well. You burn Jackson Arnold's red shirt. You may as well have him play. Well, I think he did some good things under duress. You know, was it a perfect he game? He did. No, it wasn't a perfect game. But it was a solid game, and I think he showed improved decision-making, improved ball security. He wasn't, you know, forcing throws. You still want him to be a little bit more aggressive maybe with the ball, but yeah. he was willing to throw the ball away at times. But there were some moments in the game that, hey, the Oklahoma offense looked functional. Uh, especially the big bomb to Brennan Thompson. We've been asking for that. We've been trying to get some deep uh, plays, some big explosive plays on offense. It just hasn't come. But Jackson Arnold, again, was you know quick drop, let it go, let it fly. It was right on the money. So, listen, this is, this is a work in progress. Jackson Arnold is not a finished product. Michael Hawkins is not a finished product. Neither are. They have a lot of talent. There's still a lot of potential there. There's still a productive quarterback in Oklahoma's future between one of these two guys. It's a matter of helping them develop in part by helping get good play around them, whether it's good wide receiver play, good offensive line play. You saw the change when a guy like Jacob Jordan started getting open for the offense. Lo and behold, we can actually do something. We can actually move the football when the running game was actually churning out some yards. Hey, we could actually move the football a little bit. And so, as much as we want to put everything on the quarterback's shoulders, and that's just the way football is discussed in this day and age, a lot has to go right around a quarterback for quarterbacks to be very, very successful. Unless you are the Patrick Mahomes and you are in tier one of quarterback play, you've got to have some help, especially when you're yeah. inexperienced. And so I'm, I'm honestly, listen, it was good for Jackson Arnold to, to sit down because he had gotten reckless with the football. He got to sit down for two plus games and, kind of regroup. And sometimes you need that. Yeah. And he said that too, in his interview, that it, it was a learning experience. It was the toughest couple of weeks for him. And Jackson Arnold, I, I believe he has matured from that and has learned how to be, be more vocal, be more uh, active with, with his teammates while at the same time, understanding his position as a leader, as well as getting out there and working. He figured, he figured some things out and he looked like the quarterback we kind of was hoping for when he got into the game. Like he said, he was throwing some deep passes. He missed probably a 70 yarder to JJ Hester that I was just hoping he would have took a little bit off of, Mm -hmm. but JJ, he moved, he moved where you wanted him to, to get open, to be able to make that catch. And as you said, now one, if once we start getting wide receivers back in, which we'll talk about injury updates a little bit later there's a good chance that you see a different version of Jackson Arnold in the future, especially, or, and you probably will see a different version of Michael Hawkins too. When you start getting actual bodies out there that you can use. Remember Michael Hawkins never played with Dion Burks, right? Burks was basically pulled at that point from the game in Tennessee when we got Hawkins out there. So he's just been playing with the guys that, you know, he practiced with, but 
He's a game situations, and you were spot on. When Jacob Jordan was able to go out there and find holes and get open, that tells you, no, some of these play calls are working, and the line was giving enough time to be able to let that play develop. The big thing is the wide receivers need to do a better job of finding ways to get open quicker, but at the same time, that play that Jackson Arnold threw to Brennan Thompson deep, he literally stopped, stopped everybody, looked on the side, made a couple of adjustments, moved the running back over. As soon as he hiked it at like one second, as soon as he hiked it, he just waited and boom. Even with those big old edges coming at him, that's the one thing I'll give to Jackson a little bit more than I will Michael is, even when he's about to get hit, he still launches it. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing I can give him props on. Michael typically tucks to keep from turning the ball over. And I respect that as well because, you know, when you feel too much heat, you don't want to turn the ball over. But Jackson will take a hit and throw it. And so you're going to need both of them for the rest of the season regardless. I do hope that Jackson goes out there and I I hope that he takes command of the offense, especially now he's got a new play caller. Well, and Jackson had another really nice throw. is that one down the sideline to J.J. Hester where he, he put it right on him. And J.J. Hester's arm probably gets a little bit held and isn't really able to make a competitive play for the football. Otherwise, that's another big chunk play in yep. the passing game. So it, it it is a little bit of everything, but Jackson Arnold has to be better. We're not going to yep. sit here and say he played a perfect game by any stretch. Again, he was just 50% completion. If you go look at Pro Football Focus's adjusted completion percentage, which is one of those things I like, it takes into account drops and throwaways, which Oklahoma's pass catchers were credited with six Robin. drops in the game. And Jackson all threw the ball away three times. So that's nine incompletions that they're kind of like saying, hey, listen, it was actually smart to probably throw the ball away and we're not going to count the drops against you. His completion yeah. percentage goes up to 72%, which is solid. That's a solid adjusted completion percentage. So it wasn't all bad. It wasn't all great. It was a solid return to the field for Jackson Arnold and hopefully something he can build on. Yeah, and that's what we want them to do. We do week over week, we gotta find a way to get better. And yeah, just get better. It seems like there's some joy going on around. And Brent Venables didn't sound like, you know, his puppy died, you know, on the show tonight. So it didn't sound as awful as it's been over the last couple of weeks with the press conferences. It felt like it was like, okay, so we're we're ready to move forward. We're gonna try something different. I think we're gonna get better. And as you said, even with the adjusted, it feels like, you know, with six drops, that hurts. Fourteen drops on the season is what PFF has accounted us for. Gosh, that's awful. But six of those came against South Carolina as we were trying to get rid of the ball quickly. Terrible. I do feel like with the new play calling, finding a way to move the pocket on a regular basis to help with, you know, any deficiencies we have there, it's going to make the team a lot better. We got to find something, right? You got to find something over the final five games to signify growth in the offense and direction at quarterback in particular because you don't want to go into 2025 not knowing who your offensive coordinator is going to be and not knowing who your quarterback of the future is going to be. That's a really, really tough place to be for any program, but especially a program like Oklahoma that has this expectation of high octane offense, at least 30 points per game, if not 40 points per game on a regular basis. So a lot of growth that has to happen over the final five games. We're going to find out about Joe John Finley, about Kevin Johns. Are they going to be up to the task or does Oklahoma have to go outside of Norman to find their next offensive coordinator? I know a lot of people have a lot of opinions about who that should be, but we're going to get into why the coaching change happened. Brent Venables explained a little bit more as to his rationale for the move coming up next here on Locked On Sooners. This week's Roy Player of the Week is Jaden Jackson. I just pitched in $100, and I'd love for you to join me. Even $10 makes a difference. Let's show Jaden Jackson the love and keep him connected to our school. Remember, pay today, celebrate tomorrow. Your support sets your team up for success. So far this season, we've pulled over $20,000 to support players on Roy. Micro deposits lead to massive change. With the Roy app, you can direct your support to the athletes you love, ensuring that all funds go to the specific player you choose. Unlike collectives, you know exactly where your support is going, and you even receive exclusive content like personal videos and updates after the season. The best part, it's risk-free. If the athlete transfers or doesn't deliver the content, you get your money back. Plus, don't miss out on Roy's exciting giveaway. Win two tickets to a game in November. Just download Roy create an account, enter referral code locked on, and you're entered. 
already on Roy. Any contribution to an athlete's campaign also gets you entered automatically. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited. Download Roy now and join the NIL game with no subscriptions and no fees. And be sure to check us out on Instagram, Facebook, and X at Roy underscore return on you for more info. Roy, support the players, change the game. Thank you again for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. Again, shout out to all the everydayers out there for tuning in and subscribing to the show wherever they get their podcasts. Jay, Brent Venables went into a little bit more as to why the coaching change happened now. Yeah, and he talked about how, you know, we're not playing winning football and this is not the historical thing for Oklahoma. And he even talked about how he hurt for the fans and they deserve a much better product. And so... With him, it was something he was thinking about and considering for a bit. And then as things just snowballed at South Carolina, it was one of those, yeah, we've got to move forward with something else. And so they have a lot of trust in Joe John Finley coming in as the as the play caller. They gave that to him mainly because Kevin Johns, it appears he was doing a lot of advanced scouting and working closely with Brent Venables on the defensive side. Uh, just, and still working with the quarterbacks, but not as – as hands-on he was working with the quarterbacks but not doing you know specifically only qb you know workouts so his focus was advanced scouting helping with the defense and stuff in which we saw how good the defense has played this year now he gets to work only with the quarterback and work with joe john on making full game planning that's what he's going to do exclusively and it makes sense today john if you really think about it joe john's the one that knows the playbook you know, Jackson Arnold came here, you know, on that Levy offense, and he's a Levy guy. I mean, he coached at Ole Miss, so there's similarities to what Lane Kiffin there that's been sprinkled in. So because of that, it feels like having Joe John run the offense and pick better plays and collaborate with his teammates should be able to help us. We didn't. I know we haven't gone all the way through our playbook, which a lot of fans are like, well, why we run the exact same plays? We're probably not. I mean, but you did see some plays with success, and it's kind of coincidental that Joe John was up in the booth, and we started to see a little bit of differences when it came to some of the plays. Some of them, not all, but some. Yeah, yeah. they probably won't ever say if Joe John took over the play calling duties at some point in the South Carolina game or not, but my conspiracy theory is at some point he did, um, and that's why you started to see them move the ball a little bit more and, and have yeah. some more success in the passing game. But, you know, Again, it wasn't completely on Seth the trail nope. because of the deficiencies in the personnel on the field. At the same time, it never felt like he adjusted for his personnel, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, everybody's highlighted it. The broadcast did, you know, every podcast has at this point we have, but using your tight ends that can't block to block two future first round draft picks on That's South Carolina's defense is just not smart ball. And that's, and I, and Brent Venables mentioned that he'd been kind of thinking about making a move for some time. He was trying to give it time to correct itself, but ultimately felt this was the best decision for the, for the program and for the future of the program. And I got to think that part of it is what happened in the South Carolina game where they made very few adjustments to try to take Dylan Stewart and Kyle Kennard out of the game. Yeah. And again, using two of your worst blockers to block those guys is not a good idea. And it's a recipe for disaster. And honestly, <laughs> we always talk about fireable offenses. That might have been the fireable offense that finally oh. was the straw that broke the camel's back for Oklahoma. The moment that you decided to put your tight ends against Kyle Kennard and Dylan Stewart, in which, like you just said, Kyle Kennard's a first-round pick as soon as he's eligible. Yep. Dylan Stewart could end up being the number one draft pick in a draft that has a weak quarterback draft, right? If like true a, freshman, a Javon, could, if, if true freshman could announce for the NFL draft, oh, he's a first-round pick a top this year. Fifty pick easily, probably a first-rounder. He's probably a first-rounder, right? He's another Jadavion Clowney, and we saw what Clowney did. I mean, everybody under remembers the uh, Jadavion Clowney's legendary hit on the Michigan player, run up yeah. the middle, smacked him, forced the fumble, picked up the Ball fumble, and start to run. Yeah. All in one, all in one swooping move, just yeah. leveled the dude and picked up the ball. Yep, that's what Dylan Stewart can do, and Dylan's an edge. And so, when you watch the way they bend and get around tackles, you should understand that you can't have a tight end there to block him. You have to have a tight end to clip him to slow him down, right. so that your quarterback can get rid of the ball. 
Right. Don't max protect with those guys. If you max protect, bring those guys into the middle and let your tackles go out wider and force them to try to go through like 13 guys. But at the same time, the bigger problem is they're still that good. You got to make a actual pocket to walk up in. So the making this change now, five games left, you're basically letting your guys audition. Mm -hmm. Now they can we can see if you're worthy or not. Don't worry, they're gonna do a national search. Now, granted, John, me and you talked about this in the green room. If we go out there and we put up four or five hundred yards total offense, start scoring forty points again, it's gonna be questions. But I promise you this: they still gonna do that national search. Yeah. I don't believe that they would even hesitate on that. Th there will be a hesitation on. Well, I don't think we should. No, I think they'll be like, no, nah, we're gonna still do the search. Mm -hmm. But everybody's gonna get the opportunity. Yeah, and I, and I think that's where Joe C will step in to help Brent Venables make a more reasonable choice as opposed to making what, Hey, what was the, the continuity choice? Yes. Seth Luttrell was the continuity choice, but again, it's a dude that had had success at several stops along the way. So it wasn't yeah. like you're taking somebody who never coordinated an offense and wasn't good at other places. He was solid and good at times. It was just the continuity choice. They didn't really take the time to go out there and, and search. And there's going to be a lot of really intriguing names um, that Oklahoma will pursue or at least look into. And Joe John Finley might be one of those names that gets an opportunity to make his pitch for the job. But a lot yeah. of that's going to depend on how these final five games go. Even if they don't average 450, 500 yards a game and 40 points a game, but they're much more competitive and they are starting to put up 25, 30 points a game. And Jackson Arnold's looking like a former five-star quarterback and someone that you can build around for the future. That's going to be enough to get him in consideration. It might not be enough to get him the job, but it'll certainly get him consideration for the job. But it's going to be a big, big offseason regardless because whatever Brent Venables decides to do will likely determine the future of Oklahoma football for years to come. And not just, not just 2025, but if it's not 2025, it's 26, 27, 28, because right. you're not just looking at a one or two year rebuild at that point. You're probably looking at a massive, massive rebuild. If the hear, offensive coordinator hire does not get right. Yep. Hear me and hear me good. Any offensive coordinator that is worth anything that you all would want, you're probably not getting him before the transfer portal opens. The yep. portal is going to open and close within what? 30 days. And, that's going to be probably when the playoffs are going to start. Indiana's so, going to be in the playoffs probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a, is a good chance at the way they're playing. Now, granted, uh, we said this in the last video, and I told y'all, we will reserve our judgments on Indiana after we see how they play over the next four games when they actually see some competition. They're playing the games that's in front of them. We totally get that. I also kind of said that about Texas, and then we saw them play against a team that was better, and they pushed them around. So... We're going to see what Indiana is, and then y'all can give me judgment then. But until then, I'm reserving my decisions on who the OC is. We'll probably talk about candidates and stuff, which I'm totally down for. But I'm going to reserve my judgment until after, after we get out of this season. And once we get into the actual time period that you can hire somebody. Because, John, do you want a coach that quits on his team to go take another job? Like who wants a who wants a coach that would do that? Nobody wants a coach that's willing to quit on their players, especially if they're going to, you know, potentially to a really good bowl game mm -hmm. or if they're potentially in the playoffs. You don't. Yeah. And most likely we're gonna chase after dudes that are playoff bound. Yeah, that or, you know, a, bro, a Brennan Marion that former head coach LV. I mean, he could be somebody that is on the the short list. He could also be in the playoff. If they can beat Boise State this week, they're on that playoff trajectory because they've got really yeah. nice wins already this season. So it, it's going to be fascinating. But yeah, the, the transfer portal window, the the cutting of the spring portal window, it certainly has a huge effect on all of this. And man, it, it's going to be fascinating to see how the offensive coordinator hire goes and what happens there. Brent Venables also discussed the wide receiver situation and the injuries and it was more intriguing what he said about the future of the position. We'll discuss coming up next here on Locked On Sooners. 
Hey, football fans, you can start the season off with big returns over at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So if you get a hunch in the middle of the game, we take some live stats, view live, play by play. You can do all of that and so much more right there in the app where you place your bets. Like right now, Oklahoma sitting here as a 20 and a half point dog on the road at Ole Miss. So, of course, we're hoping that the Sooners can pull the upset. And if you want to take advantage of that, you can. You could get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. So go over there to FanDuel.com and check it out. Again, thanks for making Lockdown Sooners your first listen every single day. We're part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. So, Jay, Brent Venables provides an injury update on the wide receiver situation. And it's really promising, but not necessarily for 2024. But Brent Venables indicated that Deion Burks, Nick Anderson, Angela Anthony, and Jalil Farouk have all expressed interest in returning for 2025, as well as trying to make it back to play in this season. Think about that. Right. Think about those guys expressing their excitement, them wanting to play next year. So Brent even gave us, they gave us updates that we've been waiting to hear about. Like everybody wondering, what's up with Nick Anderson? Well, coincidentally, today, he told us torn quad, which typically takes three months to heal. We don't know when the quad was torn because he didn't give a specific, but it takes three months. If he comes back this year, could be late November, yeah. could be bowl game. There's a possibility there, right? Dion Burks is day to day and he's tr- working hard to come back. I sense he plays this weekend. That's kind of my thought. We'll see when we get the uh, injury report on Wednesday. And then Andrew Anthony wanting to come back after having another procedure. Jalil Farouk's a few weeks away. So there's a chance by Bama, we've got three wide receivers back. That would change so much. And hopefully by then, we've snuck three wins. I'm not saying we will, but I'm just saying. It would be nice if we've snuck three wins at that point. We're going to be – we're going to be – Cautiously optimistic around in these streets, John. But what would it be like if we did get three dudes back before the Alabama game? I mean, it'd be huge. I mean, we're seeing that that Alabama team is not the Alabama of old. They're not the Nick Saban Alabamas. And they've proven that they're beatable. I'm not saying Oklahoma can beat them. I'm saying that they've shown that they're beatable. If you That's all that matters. Deion, yeah, if you can get Deion Burks back this week, that provides a huge boost to your offense. Um, it might sit Jacob Jordan down, unfortunately, because that dude played 100% of his snaps out of the slot. And where's Deion Burks play? He plays in the slot. In slot. Maybe you move Deion Burks outside. Um, two slot guys. Or run two <laughs> slot guys. Run a lot more 10 personnel. Get your tie downs off the field. Uh, but get him back. I, I think it's it's probably wise to continue to let Jalil Farouk just take his time. You're not in any hurry. Your season is pretty much done. You don't need to rush him back. But if you can get him back for Alabama and LSU, that's huge, man. That and that comes after the bye week, so we've had a lot of time to heal that foot and get himself game ready. That's that's awesome. If Angel Anthony's back at any point this year, that's incredible. Yep. And Nick Anderson, I'm expecting not to see him again for 2024. But the but, fact that yeah, but the fact that all four of those guys want to be back next year, I thought it was I thought it was probable that Angel Anthony would be back because this the season has kind of been a wash for him. I thought that it was going to be probable that Nick Anderson might come back unless he just decided, you know what? I don't want to deal with the injury stuff at the college level. I'm ready to go pro. Uh, and then obviously I think Jay Gibson will be back after his knee injury, but you don't know what he's going to be like for 2025. And so the question was going to be Dion Burks. Cause I think that dude is going to test incredibly well whenever he decides to go to the NFL scouting combine, he will throw up a ton of weight, He'll throw up a ton of reps on the bench. He'll jump out the gym. He'll run a great 40. So I think he could go to the NFL draft this year and still be a top 100 pick, even after kind of an injury riddled 2024 season, because he's going to test incredibly well. But the fact that he wants to come back potentially, I mean, that's, that is awesome. Now, if you can keep all these guys healthy, that's huge for 2025. Yeah, it is. And, the possibility of seeing at least three of them back is huge. So we know that Gibson is done for the year. We shouldn't even consider that possibly Andrew Anthony, but with that thigh injury, he he mentioned that it was torn and said that, you know, there's a possibility that 
he could come back. Three, it's a three month, uh, three month um, uh, and, re- rehab Anthony. injury. Yeah, yeah, it's a three month time period for him to heal on that one. But to me, looking at Farouk, who's out of his boot, he's been out of his boot for two weeks, and so he's getting back in shape, and he's right. He's at what the six week mark now. Yeah, it's about I mean, six weeks, so I think he's got two weeks away. He'll be at eight weeks, and BV said he's right on schedule. So if you get him before Missouri with Deion Burks, who's back healthy, and then maybe you sneak in an Andrew Anthony there, there is a possibility you get three dudes back by Maine and then Bama. That would change everything for us. That would that would take a lot of burden off of everybody's minds and shoulders. But if anything, we need to see what this team looks like this week with the current players before we start to really uh, count any of those eggs that definitely haven't hatched yet. That's right. Yeah. You, you got to make sure that you get somewhat of a functional offense, which with what you have available and, and I, and I'm with you, I think Dion Burks plays, it seemed like he could have maybe pushed to go last week, but they held him out. I mean, he mm-hmm. went through all the warmups, was in full pads and all of that, but that's their typical timeline, right? They, they warm, they get a guy game ready, at least through warmups. And then it's the next week that they bring him back. So hopefully yeah. he comes back next week. Cause that will provide a boost to the offense. Again, it opens up so much for you when you have a guy with his ability to get open and his ability to win downfield, his ability to run the jet sweeps. I mean, he can make so many plays for you in so many different ways that it, it will help your offense. And I think that even if you just get him back for the rest of the season, it's a game changer because he is a game changing player. That's true. He's a difference maker for this team. So you kind of want him on the field more than you want the other guys, because then at that point, to me, I want to see more Zion Kearney. He looked pretty solid. It was in the Texas game. I kind of want to see more of him out there. Keep Jacob Jordan running in the slots with Deion Burks. Keep J.J. Hester. He hasn't been the greatest, but he's been reliable enough in comparison to what we've had. So you play those four on a consistent basis, probably get Petaway going. I'm not sure what's going on with him. It doesn't, I don't, I, we haven't really seen much of him. But at the same time, this is where, as I'm talking about these players, remember this, we've got a new offensive coordinator. Things are going to probably change. He's probably going to use different rotations in comparison. It felt like, We were trying to play a lot of speed guys on a regular basis. And unfortunate thing is with some speed guys, you got to give them a little bit of time to get out and get open. Nah, sometimes we need to go ahead and muscle some folks. Give me some possession dudes who can run that quick hitch, run that curl, deep curl, run a quick drag and catch it across and get ready to get down. We need to start leveraging some bigger bodies and just getting them going. I want to see more Zion Kearney. That's the one dude I want to see the most. Give me more him. Give me JJ Hester with him. And if Burks comes back, him and uh, Jacob Jordan can start us off. I mean, I, it appears we're not, we're never going to see Jacoby. So I've kind of just, you know, that's that's out my mind, John. Jacoby Johnson is not going to play on the defense side of the ball. I'm mean, offensive side of the ball because we've seen him on defense. So I'm just like, oh, whatever at this point. But I yeah, want to see us just use some bodies. That's it. Yeah, and it was nice to see them get Jacob Jordan into the game because listen nothing else has really worked for you at wide receiver yep. consistently, right? You've, you've tried, you know, Zion Raggins, there just doesn't seem to be a great comfort level with him right now in the offense. And so you had to try something different and credit to Emmett Jones for throwing Jacob Jordan out there and giving him a shot because he had not played an offensive snap for Oklahoma this year, according to pro football focus. And nope. they put him out there for 47 snaps and 38 of those were pass plays. And then he was in there for nine run plays. Um, and he came through and he contributed for you. I mean, six catches for 80 yards. And he looked very, very comfortable playing college football, which is huge for a true freshman walk on. So you got to figure out oh, a way yeah. to continue to get him on the field and make him a part of your offense because he's earned the opportunity to do so. Uh, looking just at other wide receiver snaps, Brennan Thompson led the way with 69 snaps. JJ Hester was 65. Jacob Jordan was third with 47. And then Raggins had 36. Uh, Ivan Carrion actually got 20 snaps, uh, but then Zion Kearney was held to 16 snaps in the game. Um, 13 of those were in pass plays. And so he got out there, but he just didn't get many opportunities to, to go play the ball. And uh, you know, let me just pull up how many targets he had. I, Cause I was exactly, I was hoping that they would get him involved in the offense as well. He got two targets, zero catches. Um, so 
it, it's it's hard to know. Carry on same, two targets, zero catches. Uh, Zion Raggins had one catch for minus four yards on a terrible screenplay mm, on third and seven. Yeah. I know I was Yo, calling for wide receiver play. screens. Please but don't call them in third them. and long situations. Yeah. Those are first and 10, third and short situation calls. Please don't do it on third and seven. Yeah, really Any, anything else you want to say about the wide receivers before we close out here, Jay? No, I'm just happy to hear that we finally got an update. This is something that we've all been waiting for. We finally get to hear what's going on with these wide receivers. And we get a little bit more details and the, and the big details with, with, you know, hearing that Nick Anderson's is something is a torn quad. And that's why he went able to do it. And if it coming from a strain that led into a tear, it's probably done for the year. But the good thing is, him and four, uh, him and five others will be back next season. Yeah, that is the silver lining, if anything, from the wide receiver group. And that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Thanks so much for tuning in and being a part of the show. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. We're free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube. Follow Jay at Unfair Sports, myself at John Nine Williams. The show is at Locked On Sooners on all the social media platforms. But until next time, he's Jay Smith. I'm John Williams. Boomer. Sooner.